things here. We've uh, another very exciting guest we've got here, uh, Mike Taylor, who's, uh, I believe, Mike, you're in Florida right now. Is that correct? Yes, Adam. We, great to see you guys. Really happy to talk basketball. A lot of exciting things, you know, for coaches and players this part of the, the year, right before the season starts. So appreciate getting a chance to come on here and talk a little hoops. Thanks again for being part of us today. Thank you, Adam. Really appreciate it. And again, you know, we're really thankful for everything that happened this summer. The people in, in Manitoba were, you know, so great for us and really supported the team so well. Um, so I'm I'm really just thankful that uh, to have the opportunity to grow the game and, and contribute to such a great community like Winnipeg. Um, and we'll talk today just about drills that can be used for professional teams which we've used in the CEBL, as you'll see from video, but also with youth teams all the way through. And I think, you know, hopefully coaches can take away uh, at whatever level they're coaching, they can take away some some positive things. I've got this PowerPoint, um, you know, coaches and everyone can follow along. Uh, we'll I'll shift back and forth between some video from a Google Drive uh, that's been set up by Josh Reddy. Uh, so we've got some video from my time in Vancouver with Fraser Valley and also last summer in Winnipeg. So we'll try to share everything. Uh, and I look forward to answering any questions as best I can at the end. But, um, you know, to get started here, uh, the Sea the Bears were something special. Uh, the city was just really hungry for basketball last summer. And I'm so proud about the way the whole organization came together. Um, you know, there was great teamwork in the front office and great teamwork with the people involved. Um, and, but again, you know, you can't ever predict uh, the, the, the response from the city. And, and obviously it's not just about ticket sales. It's about the game. Winnipeg loves basketball. Uh, it is a great market for the CEBL. And I think the, the response for teams and players playing at different levels is the most wonderful thing that can come out of it because that's the next generation. Uh, so hopefully we can share some details and things that can help coaches. Uh, but I have so many wonderful memories from last summer in Winnipeg and really looking forward to, you know, the next summer as we start to build up the team, moving things ahead. Again, when you start talking about uh, developing drills for teams at different ages, I think the big thing that coaches have to think about are teaching fundamental skills even at the professional level, you know, you've got to refine those fundamentals. And while your information you're dealing with is a little more advanced, you know, at the, at the heart of it, it's fundamentals, it's skills. Uh, I think you, the key thing for coaches is to adjust the drills to the level of the player that they're dealing with. Prepare a practice plan with action and fun to keep kids engaged. And of course, that's more important. The younger kids you're working with um, know your progression. Uh, I think that's really important uh, for everyone. I think that the, the the progression allows you to stay on track and allows you to, uh, let's say, progress step by step, uh, whether it's a skill or, you know, an action that you're covering. And then I think especially for younger kids, repeat the drills and refocus on skills. So, you know, we've used a lot of the drills you're going to see today at the professional level, but I think you can apply them as I have at different times uh, with youth kids and youth teams as well, boys and girls. I went the wrong direction there. Sorry. Basketball at its heart should be fun. Practice should be fun. The team should enjoy each other coming to the gym. And again, there's things that get in the way of that, that you have to try to navigate your way through as a coach. But at the heart of it, that enthusiasm, uh, the passion for the game, this is what you're trying to create an environment that feeds. It feeds the players. They, they feel they're getting better. They're having fun with their teammates. Um, and again, this is kind of, you know, managing the team and creating a structure that is helping the players feel the improvement and the team feel the improvement along the way. I think feeding the intrinsic motivation is really where it starts. I think a coach has to have a relationship with the players. A lot of times that starts with player development. When you spend time with someone and you show them you care, you're trying to give them instruction, give them direction. But that intrinsic motivation is the most important thing for coaches to aim for at all ages to help players do it because they love to do it because they want to do it and create that positivity around it. Again, I think when you have a system that is structured, a system that is organized, you can connect the team through that system, right? That's important uh, as they're working hard together to master the set plays or master the concepts that you're working on in your system, the details, uh, they, they connect and they come together. And what you're going to see today are drills that we've used to try to connect the team on the court. 
all right, I have the ball. What happens next? I'm not just going to put my head down and go one-on-one. We're going to try to create this situation where I know if I don't have an immediate advantage created, I'm going to move the ball to the next play and try to create an advantage together, connecting with my teammates. Now, the one thing I think all coaches should think about, and again, my father was a coach. He coached at, a, at all levels. He challenged me early because, you know, I, I knew that I wanted to be a basketball coach when I was very young. It's like, hey, develop your own system, develop your own philosophy. We would have conversations about, Mike, how do you think practice should be run? Mike, how would you handle this situation? What type of team, what type of style do you want to play? I think coaches, especially as they're in their formative years, they're trying to answer these questions for themselves. And what I've always tried to do is put the philosophy on one sheet of paper. Uh, so as you see here, we've got basically sea bear ball. Um, and, and as you look at sea bear ball, it's, you know, again, win with team defense, control the defensive boards, run for layups and threes, pressure the rim, on and on and on. It's just the full process of a, of a, let's say, possession or, you know, flow of the game. And if you can fill in your philosophy and details and, and most important coaching points on one sheet of paper, it helps you stay organized. And when you have an organized system and a clear philosophy, that helps your teaching progression. And then as you have that organized and clear philosophy and, you know, structure the teaching that you're after, then you can adjust that really, I think, pretty efficiently uh, to different ages and different skill levels. Uh, so this is something I would challenge everyone to do uh, to really think about, you know, how they see the game, what's important to them, what their philosophy is, what their style is. And then again, one of the things I love is after the sea bear season, you know, revisiting the whole, the whole point and say, Hey, we're, we were good at this. We were not good at this. What can we do better? So constantly trying to improve, constantly trying to adapt and adjust uh, and get your system better. One of the things that I also love is really having great teamwork as a coaching staff, surrounding yourself with great coaches. And in Winnipeg, we had a fantastic staff. I had so much fun this summer. Uh, we can tell you, and, and Adam, you were around our guys quite a bit. Um, you know, again, starting with uh, – Ryan Thompson, the head coach at uh, Lakehead, he was he was great for us. Uh, Juwan Brown did so many great things in terms of skill development, and we'll talk more about some of the things that he did in practice later. Um, Mike Rainbow, uh, the head coach at the University of Winnipeg. Uh, these guys in particular, you know, Juwan with his expertise in player development, skill development, Ryan and Mike thinking like head coaches, you know, you could have great conversations with them and, and talk philosophy and talk, you know, situations that pop up. Uh, so they, they were great. And, you know, Josh Reddy, who's now working with Mike, uh, has been so great in Vin in Vancouver and in Winnipeg, working with, let's say, the, um, the video and uh, quality control of the team. And he's the guy you'll see in a little bit, the, the Google Drive that he organized. that has been fantastic for us. Uh, you know, just really having all access to, to our information here over the last two years. But when you have a great staff around you, it's really important to use them. Uh, and this is one of the things I've loved the last two years. You'll see in a little bit some of the things that you pick up from the coaches that are around you and, and really just try to enhance what you're doing. So, again, you know, just really having a great connection, great relationship with your staff not only makes it fun, but also helps you as a coach grow. Uh, in 2018, 2019, 2019, 2020, I had a really unique experience. Um, I was the head coach of the Polish national team at the time, while also coaching the Hamburg Towers in German Pro A, which is the second division. And then we eventually won the league and move up to the Bundesliga. So over those two years, I had the opportunity to run, let's say, the system that I, my system, the system that I've, I've used and continually try to grow and develop on different levels. So with the Polish national team, we ran it on a really high level, really high level, very intelligent players. I used to love to watch these guys. Once you install the system, watch them, how they use the system and how they read the game. And you come up with different actions and different things that are creative. And you're like, wow, I'm going to add that. That's impressive. I love that. Then, you know, you have a little bit system that's maybe not as detailed or let's say we say depth of system with the Hamburg Towers German Bundesliga team. The players are just maybe not that experienced or not as well coached. And then on the lower level, we had uh, Vedel, which was the farm team for the Towers. But we had the same philosophy, the same style of play, the same terminology on three different levels. And it was really, really interesting in terms of player development, in terms of 
uh, you know, structuring the drills and really points of emphasis and coaching points on a daily basis. Uh, the head coach of Vedal was my assistant with Hamburg. Um, and, you know, we really worked in connection so that the chance to see the system work and operate at three different levels of the game was really, really interesting and fun. So it started in 2018 in Gazichko, Poland. You know, with these national teams, there's only a certain number of, let's say, high level prospects. And you're always trying to find a way to increase the player pool. So I, my first year was 2014 and we had gone through a cycle of some players and it was time to start finding some new guys. So we talked like, what can we do? Well, we started a B team and we had a B team development camp in Gizitko, Poland. We had the opportunity then to run the same system as the national team guys, put it in for new players who really hadn't seen it or had any experience with it before. Uh, and we put it in, we installed it, uh, and we tried to increase that player pool. And it turned out three or four of those guys went on to play with, with the Polish national team. Um, you know, several guys had, had made that jump. But the chance to watch these guys take in the information, pick up the situation, and, and try to work on it, it was really interesting. Uh, we played against the Belarus team, uh, their B team, for two games in Białystok, Poland, for the Bison Trophy. Uh, we won both games. It was a really good experience for these guys. And I felt like it was uh, interesting to see the next generation of young players picking up systems and details and coaching points. Um, very, very interesting. But not only those three levels of, let's say, the farm team for the, the towers, the towers and, uh, you know, the Canadian, or, um, the Polish national team, the Polish national team, B team. We had great success in those times. You know, that was the great run for Poland in, in the 2019 World Cup. You know, the Hamburg Towers, we won the second league, moved up to the Bundesliga. Uh, so during that time, it was not only successful with the top team, but also good development for some of the lower levels. Last summer uh, or last winter, I had the opportunity to be home and spend time with, with my sons. And I got a chance to coach a, a seven-year-old team at the YMCA League. Now. Anybody that's coached seven-year-olds know that this is far away from a professional basketball setting or high-level basketball setting. Uh, but it was really interesting to see, you know, the game at this level and, and really try to help the kids enjoy the game, work on their skills, uh, and some of the things that I'm sure all coaches at youth levels face. And the reason I bring all of these points up is people look at, oh, Mike, you got a really high level resume, really experience around the Celtics, experience national teams, you know, 20 years in Europe, now coaching the Sea Bears. But I think the most important thing to me is, you know, whatever level you're coaching at, connect with your team, try to maximize your team. Everyone wants to coach a championship level team, but certain teams are not built for that. So it's about the game. It's about building a relationship with your players, building a relationship with your team and trying to help them maximize their experience, maximize their time. Uh, for those that are interested, number 22 is my son, Luke. Uh, and we had a pretty good run with the Bulls last winter going three, three and one. So some of the points that I talked about or focused on during that time, uh, we really focused the first part of our practices, probably the first 30 minutes on fundamental skills, dribbling, passing, shooting, footwork. Uh, floor spacing, of course, is a huge issue at that age. So floor spacing in the half court and in transition. We tried to get some lane discipline in transition, uh, tried to give the, the kids spots to run to uh, rather than just follow the ball and call for the ball, the pack mentality. Sharing the ball, of course, at this age was really key in terms of moving the ball and, and you know, finding your teammates when they're open and just generally getting kids to cut to the basket rather than cut to the ball. I'm sure youth coaches have, have dealt with that. But the one thing that I loved and I thought really helped the kids was advantage and disadvantage situations. So we spent a lot of time with two on one, three on two, four on three, five on four situations. I think it helped basically create the advantage and give the kids a clear picture like, OK, here's the next pass. Uh, so these were some of the things at different levels that, that kind of took away and, you know, loving the game, loving coaching at different levels. But now I'd like to get into the main point here of, of our discussion. What are some team drills that we can use at, at different levels? And, and, you know, whether they're professional players, it's going to be helpful with different focuses, different coaching points. Or you move down here, we'll see if we can get our 11-man break going. 11-man um, break to me, continuous three on two. Uh, you know, that's a situation where, you know, you're always 
as a pro level, you're letting guys really get up and down and, and move the ball and kind of get a good rhythm and feeling for practice. And with youth, you know, I think you use it more for, let's say, uh, you know, you, you use it more for teaching. So as we go here to our video, little difficulty, we see 11 man break here. Uh, the sea bears, we're working in a warm up part of our practice, two on one continuous, actually three on two continuous here, working on our outlets. Again, we emphasize, you know, layups and threes, even big Chad shooting a three there in transition. Again, you can see the, the opportunity for the players to make reads, attack closeouts, space the floor, turn it into a two-on-one and get to the rim. But again, I think for professional team, for youth teams, I think it's, you know, important that you can warm the guys up and work on lots of different skills. So this is just a fundamental drill for different levels. Again, beating one defender, creating a good shot for your teammate. Most of the time we will be in this 11 man break after our, let's say we have a, we have a walkthrough, a warm up, a two teams where we split to two baskets and work on breakdown drills and then get into our 11 man break transition. So this is kind of a warm up drill to get the guys really ready for practice. Again, for youth teams, you can use it coaching wise, breaking down, attacking a three on two, defending the three on two, working on ball movement, working on teamwork. Yeah, and this is a drill players really look forward to. They love it. Uh, really like to, uh, you know, get up and down and get a feeling. Coaches reminding guys to limit their turnovers, good communication. Great. Okay. So let's move back. Let's go to the five on five. No dribble if we can get it going here. And this was uh, with Fraser Valley, Vancouver team from last year. And again, before our technical difficulty, we have, again, ball movement, floor spacing, really good as a warm up for you know a higher level team play without the ball work together you see we have a dribble automatic turnover for lower level teams Great to get them aware of playing without the ball, passing and cutting. Opportunity to work on different floor spacing.
we'll stop it there and move forward here. All right. So let's and move it forward. So here we are with King's Quick Inbound, which will be our next one. And this is an excellent drill for another good warm up drill for a higher level team, which works on quick inbound, making a layup. Uh, taking an outlet as a point guard from a banana cut or from a high outlet. We'll look at both of them. Uh, but, you know, for young kids, it's even just the thought of inbounding the ball, right? So you've got a layup, you've got some passing and cutting, you've got different situations here. But again, as we go back here, I'll share the screen again. So we see our three lines, layup line, Quick inbound, banana cut from our point guard. Another good warm-up drill, lots of passing. Banana cut, outlet. One ball moving around. Finish your layups. We like to position the coaches at different places. You can see Ryan on the baseline. He's talking to the guys, quick inbound, quick inbound, quick inbound. Jamie along the baseline, talking to the point guards. Jamie Perlman, talking to the guards. Banana cut, high outlet, move the ball. And we'll move it up here to 4.30. Now we're going to start getting into our high outlet. We like to have the high outlet. We're back to the sideline so we have vision. But again, the drill is executed the same way with a quick inbound, high outlet. Again, great for the youth teams to work on their passing. Try to give them a little opportunity to get a rhythm so they follow the rotation of the drill. Big men running to the rim, quick inbound. Good work from the guys here. Now we'll move on while I've got it up because it's right on this video here. Uh, at 625, Mark, we go into uh two on one half court finish. So you'll see how we set it up here. So again, we've got a line with balls in the middle. Just so happens to be all big men here. Thomas Kennedy, number 30. He's uh, going to throw the ball to one of the wings and they attack two on one. Again, guys, working to finish strong at the rim. You'll hear the coaches talk about pressuring the rim, getting to the rim with high level players. Executing in a two on one situation, defending in a two on one situation. Here, get to the rim, get to the rim, pressure the rim. Important to work with players of all ages, making good decisions with advantages, transition, and finishing.
We'll move forward. The next part of the progression here would be two on one full court finish. And this is a little difficult angle to see just because of the way the Langley Event Center was set up. But we got it on video for you here. So again, it's the same situation. Two on one half court finish. Now two on one full court finish, three lines. Player passes the ball, and now we're attacking at full speed. I love this drill for all ages because it helps players play at pace, play at speed. Handling the ball, passing and catching at speed, making good decisions and finishing. And as you can see, we have the, the whole group, all the groups of three go at one end and then go back. It's not down and back. We'll stop sharing the screen here and go back to our PowerPoint. Uh, here's the two-on-one finish from the half court, the two-on-one full court finish. The two-on-one dunker game will be something that we would do in pre-practice while, you know, again, our, our structure would be walk through, warm up, two teams. When we're in those two teams, we can have that dunker game where you're working on challenging vertically straight up at the rim, step into the open area, making decisions. So you have plays at the rim, transition in the half court, transition in the full court. Now this next one is great for preseason, for conditioning. Uh, I think kids love it because of the race at the end, uh, but it also can really be good for uh, showing, let's say the, the fundamentals of transition, you know, sprinting the floor, getting a good angle to the rim, getting to a two foot jump stop when necessary. Uh, and then a good team conditioning drill, particularly, you know, for, for the preseason. This is something we've always done in training camps at different levels. But the Nash drill, working on pace, working on lane discipline, angles to score, quick inbound, sprinting the floor, and ball ahead passing. So let's take a look here. We'll go back. We'll bring this back. Okay. So as you can see here, we've got – Coach Jamie with the ball. We've got our post line. They should be at the nail. Our point guard line, even with the passing coach. And these are our wings, the conditioning line. They're going to run for a layup at 45. Point guards are going to run and get that banana cut. And bigs are inbounding the ball. And it's going to be a race between the wings and the quick inbound to get the ball back to the, the coach. So let's take a look. We'll let, let you watch it and see how it unfolds. Again, we want the guards to take one dribble before they ball a head pass to give the runners a chance. This is the type of drill early in the preseason to try to set the tempo, set the tone, really emphasize with your team to sprint the floor. Again, rotating lines. Bigs usually staying at the bigs. 
rotating lines between the guards. At different times, we've tried to do jump shots or different things with this drill, but it's always just worked best with the race at the end uh, for conditioning and pace. We'll stop it there and move on. So the next thing I think also can be really helpful for kids at, at different ages. So let's go down where I think we're at a different one. All right. We'll go back here, screen share, ice drill. So the ice drill is something that for me, uh, I think is really important for a number of reasons. And I want you coaches to think about how many times you as a coach have, have had players that really didn't know how to play within themselves. Or, you know, I think the four man power forwards an interesting position, really impactful and important on a team. But how many times have you had power forwards that tried to play like guards? And we want to try to have guys understand their roles, who the creators are on the team. So when you have a big man in the ice drill, he's popping and he's finding the next teammate to connect with. And we'll see some videos of it in a second. But here, the base way to practice it, you got three lines, point guards with the ball on one, swing it through the five, and then go set your screen you're engaging ice coverage. So they're forcing the ball, keeping it on one side, forcing it down. You're engaging the big man defender and the five man pops. Now at that point, the five is open. And this is your all your mentality of good to great, of, you know, make the next pass, find your teammates. Instead of him just trying to go one-on-one -on -one or shooting an open three, make a play with your teammate, connect with your playmaker. So now he can pass the ball in either direction to a guard he can follow it with a screen or he can screen away or he can dribble hand off in either direction. And I think the ice drill really helps connect teammates and it helps players play within themselves. It gives your offense more discipline uh, as you're working to score. So, so let's go get into our ice drill with three lines. And you can see, bring it back a second. We have the ball reversed through the center, through the big man at the top, swings it. And now here's the ice coverage, ice, 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 step into the slot. And now here's a cross screen for a shot. You'll see the ice drill options from the big. Swing it through the center, engage the big. And now you've got ice drill. This time we got a wide pin down away. Reverse it through the center, ice coverage, fives popping, again, wide pin. Again, you're playing through your big, you're letting your big be a decision maker, but he's disciplined enough to find his guard, dribble hand off opposite. Bigs let the guards be creators. And again, you're forcing the oppose, opponent big man to have to make plays, have to guard multiple actions. And this, I think, is great to help young players learn to play together. So if you're young players, you have your guards handling the ball, bigs in the screen, but you want these players to play all different positions. Overcut, layup shot we'll move it ahead just a little bit just to show you as you get with bigger older players that they can eventually learn to go both ways we swing it starting with the ball on the left to the right because they're right-handed but now you'll see the bigs be able to go either way thomas kennedy goes the same way Chris McLaughlin, opposite.
if we have time at the end, I have some five on five ice drill practice video clips that you know can show this in action. But I think that when you work with young teams, this helps the ball movement and helps the structure and helps the flow uh, rather than just having four guys trying to play one on one and attack like guards. OK, we'll go to the next one. So next thing we're going to get into is our team shooting drills. And again, you know, some of these are more applicable for younger kids than others. But this is the way that we worked on the shooting, the ball movement uh, with the Sea Bears. First thing, we don't have video of this, but this is finished series, the Celtic shooting. And this is something I think is great. A lot of teams use it for warm up. Uh, I think it's great for all ages. You can really coach fundamentals, coach footwork with younger kids. Our progression for the older players is, as you see in the, the first box, lay up outside hand off one foot, lay up inside hand off one foot, uh, slash to finish. We That's our terminology for two feet uh, outside hand, two feet inside hand, Parker in the paint, just quick finish with two, uh, one dribble, hop to power, pro hop in the lane. And then as it moves out into the second uh, box, Two-step V-cut, catch and shoot, working on all your fundamentals, good passing. Uh, again, you know, one thing when you're working with younger players, whenever every player has a ball, you got to, you know, keep them focused because they'll be dribbling and doing crazy stuff. But again, you know, you're focused here on the two-step V-cut, the shooting, uh, and again, moving it out. You know, if you're working with younger teams, keep them in their range, mid lane and nail, things along those lines. Uh, so finish series to Celtic shooting, I think, is a great shooting drill for kids of all ages, teams of all ages. Now, pop shooting is, you know, our terminology for playoff penetration. And this is uh, from Rocket Ball. It's basically a relocation shooting drill. So the lines start in the middle of the ball, wings, two passers, as you can see. Uh, we always go to the right. You can go both ways with older kids, but we always just go to the right because of the right hand dribbling. Point guard dribbles, enters it to the wing, wing drives baseline. We fill the corner, opposite corner fill, corner drift, and then the guards relocate. So the two passers then in this case are going to pass to the, the top and then pass to the corner. Uh, then we've got one consecutive pass. So instead of shooting the original three, like the first box, the second box, we swing it to the second. And then the coaches are hitting the guys in the corners for three. And then the third one, it's all the way around. So you're working on eliminating us unnecessary dribbles. You're working, you know, play off the catch, quick ball movement, teamwork, relocating. And again, the key thing, youth, you can put some tape on the floor and have them run to the X's or run to the tape uh, so that they stay in their shooting. Well, here's our pop so shooting. As you can see, our two coaches are set up as passers. Ball line is in the middle and the shooters are on the wing. And, you know, you can eventually, if you want to put fives, not shooting threes, you can put a post line here on the baseline. But we just have all of our players because of the ball movement and passing on the perimeter. Uh, we have them all taking part in the drill. Going to the right, driving baseline, corner drift, relocating corner threes. Again, you can set a target. Whatever you know, target you want to set for your team. Number of makes, put a time limit different things you can do right here. We're just kind of using it as a warm up shooting drill. Again, I think especially with younger players, the opportunity to find floor space, find an open spot without the ball, improve the passing angle, you know, delivering good passes, you know, being ready to shoot, all these little things you can coach up. We'll move it ahead here. 
to the extra pass, the consecutive pass. So now instead of the corner three, consecutive pass to the top, and coaches are hitting the, th the three-point shooters relocating in the corner. Move it on to the all the way around the horn. So this there's going to be two consecutive passes here. One swing, two swings, and now coaches are both passing to the left. Usually put 10 minutes on the clock for the shooting drill and kind of rotate it three. Sometimes we'll be like, hey, make three in a row, make three in a row uh, to make sure that, you know, they're they're working towards something. Okay, we'll keep. So we just had pop shooting. Again, the next one will be flow shooting. And I like flow shooting for the same reason as uh, the ice drill. Um, I think that, you know, you have to give your players, uh, like help them recognize what the next clear picture, clear play is. So the ice drill, when the, when the big man pops, you know, a smart big will recognize like, okay, I'm going to swing the ball and screen away. I'm going to swing it and follow for pick and roll. Here's the same situation on the second side action, for example, the high low. You know, I think this is a great way, these shooting drills to coach players to read the game and see the game and, and just kind of what their progression should be. Big man catches it in a high post. He's looking high low. If he doesn't have it, he's immediately going to the second side. Uh, so, Again, guards, you can work on pass entry, dribble entry, uh, high, low in the post to post or on the opposite side, you know, the corner threes. Then the second side, pass or dribble entry and the second side action. So we've got some video here of flow shooting. So here's the beginning of flow shooting. Again, you can see our posts are going to be at the high post and the low post. We're going to have our wing entry. Again, wing entry, side pick and roll, high low from the post to post. After the guard who is in the pick and roll swings it for the high low, he receives a pass from a coach. And just out of the picture to the left, you can't see, we've got another coach passing for the corner three. So you see the player cutting through to the corner. He gets a corner three. So both guards are getting shots and there's one shot between the posts 
in the first part of flow shooting. As you work with younger players and you work with them reading pick and rolls and learning to play pick and roll for the first time, a lot of times it's easier for them to play from triple threat than off the dribble. So they can, you know, use their misdirection fakes in one way and, and you know, have a set stable defender. So I think that's, as you start to teach pick and roll, this can be one of the drills that you, you work a defender in and help the young player read it out of a triple threat. One thing we say to the bigs here is passes out of the strike zone. So from knees to the shoulders, we try to pass it below the knees or above the shoulders. Defenders' hands are in the paint. So you can see our pass, our bigs passing the ball out of the strike zone. So now we'll get into dribble entry. We can fast forward a little bit here. Dribble entry, we push the guard through. He's in the corner now. Bigs are still going high-low. So now we've got a pick and roll off the dribble. One thing for young kids and young players you might want to think about is every time there's a pick and roll that they're executing, have the – screener and the ball handler slap five. So that will be with their inside hand, the hand closest to each other. And the reason to do that is just to remind them to come off it body to body. I think that helps young players get a feeling for really using the screen the right way. But we'll move it ahead now to the second side action. This is going to be our second side action from flow shooting. So now, oh, my fault. So now when the ball comes to the top, as you see number 40, Sukman Sandu, he's going to swing it to the second side, and that can be pick and pop. It could be dribble handoff. But now we've moved our passer who was in the wing. Now he's at the nail. You can see Coach Jamie Perlman passing at the nail. So now there's one pass. There's one pass on the second side. And you can see this is a time where we say, hey, we want three. We want all three makes. Pick and roll shooting. We don't have any video of this, but again, as we talk about pick and roll shooting, this is kind of a, a staple pick and roll drill for us. We work on a lot of different things, pocket pass, lob, uh, short roll, pick and pop, snake, reject, late delivery, or getting into the ice drill. You know, I think it's a skill for guards to be able to hit the roller. And then it's a skill for the roller to be able to make a mid-roll decision. So we'll talk about some of these mid-roll plays. And I think you, you can really help kids understand passing angles and things like this. So, you know, we'll put some defenders here on the pick and roll situation. But 
you're trying to help them understand the timing, the angles of, of passing. Start with all your bigs underneath and all your guards up top. Now, when you got younger kids and you're making this extra pass here or two extra passes with another shooting line, you know, it, the timing can be tough because they've got to be focused and aware and alert. So you want to be thinking about that. But here's the pick and roll. You know, we always want our pick, big man to settle the screen. We're coming off the screen. And again, whatever you want these guys to work on, hit the roller on the on the dive, hit the roller on the pop. Uh, but the guard is relocating for a three. You can use the pick and roll at the top or set pick and roll on the side. And then as you see in the middle drill, middle, you can work on different passes. So here we've got a throwback. We're lifting from the backside, and now we're going to hit the diving big off of the pass, you know, from the point guard to the two. And to me, this type of playoff pick and roll is, is really what's missing from North American basketball play. When you talk about European play, you talk about attacking a defense and pick and roll five on five. But how many times are young kids coached to really be unselfish enough to read the defense and move the ball? So here, let's say they hard show, get the ball out of your hands, swing it back, throw back, and now we hit the five with the hockey assist play. Throw back, advance pass, diagonal pass. This is an easy shooting drill where you can work on all your pick and roll actions, but really coach young players to make all those passes and attack the pick and roll together. The last third box is an ice drill. Again, you know, as I we showed you before, the ice drill I think is tremendous for team structure and teamwork and connecting players. You know, I've seen the Spanish national team with the Gasol brothers. I've seen them make this a huge part of their offense out of diamond set, just popping the big, giving it to them, and playing through Mark Gasol, Paul Gasol, making those decisions. So this is another way to make the opposing big man guard multiple situations. It's really valuable to an offensive team, and I think it's really good for young kids to learn how to play. So here's how to get into your ice drill out of the pick and roll, out of this pick and roll shooting. Five man's coming up. He's picking and popping. And now you've got a line in the corner and your point guard, he steps, uh, steps to the slot. Now you've got two targets and then you've got your ice drill options. Dribble handoff in either direction. Pass it. Follow your pass for pick and roll in either direction or screen away in either direction after the pass. So, again, with youth teams, interchangeable lines, performing all the skills but I really love the pick and roll shooting drill to really coach a lot of the basic pick and roll attack. The other thing to think about for young kids in, in, okay, this is set up with, you know, four passes, four coaches, coaches passing. Uh, this is a structure drill for your basic post reaction. When the ball goes into post, we call this wheel with a wide basket cut uh, screen and dive to the rim, the opposite corner filled and a pullover. So basically, whatever your post reaction is, you know, you have five shots out of it. But I think with young kids, you can use it to kind of break them down to, hey, this is how we feed the post. We split, feed the post, basket cut. Here's our post reaction when the ball comes in the post. So again, you're using your shooting drill time in practice to work on your concepts, work on your philosophy. Uh, so those would be like, uh, we would pick one of the shooting drills a day, pick and roll shooting, uh, post reaction shooting flow shooting, pop shooting, we rotate them all uh, consistently so that guys get really get comfortable with them. Now, this next one, I really love for just a fun team drill. We call it Boca shooting. Two years ago, I went to uh, spend a week in Miami. I was at University of Florida with Coach Laranega, and I was at Florida Atlantic with Dusty and, and his staff. And I had a great time, really saw a lot of good things. And it's not a surprise, Florida Atlantic went on the great run that they did. But I really loved this two-on-one drill. Now, it's drawn up here in the box with both sides going because they ran it with both sides. We've made it a team drill on one side of the floor. We'll show you in a little bit here. But basically, it's a two-on-one. You're working on multiple efforts from your defense. Uh, you're on the back side. you got to try to play two. And what's interesting about it to me is it comes out a lot as the, like the defender's they know their teammates, so it's a know your personnel situation. The guy with the ball is not a great shooter. The guy in the corner is a great shooter, so I'm going to shade to him. Um, so basically, that's an interesting part of it. It's an offensive drill where you you have a two-on-one and you have one pass and one dribble to score. And our guys love it. We'll split 10 minutes. We'll put 10 minutes on the clock. One team will be on offense for five minutes. The other team will be on offense for five, and they're trying to beat each other. Typically, they're scoring about – you know, anywhere from 20 to 25. Um, 
So we'll take a look here. But youth players, what I like to do with, with my son's team, we put a players just inside the elbow and one defender right at the right at the rim. And he had to close out one or two, and it just became like a two-on-one situation. We, you know, we limited the, the dribbles and passes, but not as not so it's just one. Uh let's take a look here at the Boca shooting from They scored. They have three. They have three. There's the know your personnel. Multiple efforts here. Again, creating rhythm threes, getting the guys more reps. You can hear Alex Campbell yelling to the black team, keep them under 20. You can see great effort there from Malcolm DeVivier defensively. One guarding two. And we'll move it ahead here. This is a drill the guys always enjoy. So we move it ahead. Now the black team is going to be on offense. So the orange finished with 23. Now they've got five minutes to try to beat it. So we have uh, a drill we call Adelaide three on three. And this was, you know, again, using your assistant coaches, using your staff. We talked about a drill to help guys with decision making and help guys about making plays. So we worked three on three. And, you know, this was also something that Juwan Brown did a lot really well. Many, many practices with us. So the thing I loved about Juwan is he stacked skills and actions from our offense together. And it was like a, a progression. It went three on three, two on two, one on one. And, you know, it was really, really well organized and designed. But we did similar things here to the three on three. So, again, three on three and a half court starts with a pass or a third dribble. I'll show you both options. Working on decision making, reading and attacking closeouts, playing off penetration together building on advantages for a good shot, defining your defensive help and multiple efforts. We put an eight second shot clock on it, but it starts with a pass. Uh, the coach will pass it and then, or the player will pass it and the, the defender gets beat. He closes out either way, high outside or inside. We're reading it. And again, you can work on your pin downs, your cutting slides, work on flares, all kinds of different situations uh, depending on it. So let's get to the video here. Let's 
skip the beginning part here. Again, working on reading the game together, creating an advantage. And you can see good floor spacing, good decisions. The next play presents itself. We had this going at both ends of the floor. This gets into some discussion here, so we'll move it ahead. So now this part of the drill, you can see weak side down screen. Even though it's an offensive drill, you can help players recognize defensive situations. We'll move ahead here. So this is what I want to show you guys. This is this other way for us to start would be three dribbles, two pound dribbles, and on a third dribble, go instead of the pass. Okay, we'll keep going here. Again, we saw the Adelaide three on three. And now we, you know, I'd like to finish with, you know, some basic offensive actions that you can work with, with all levels, all ages to try to help players read the game and play together. So the first thing we talk about is blast, where you would have a, a big man in the middle of the floor and a five out, and you're a player at the 45 set a down screen and that player in the corner comes in for a dribble handoff. Five man who's handing off, four man who's handing off, diving to the rim, and then stepping out behind. Uh, again, I think blast action is is excellent, you know, difficult to guard and helps players, you know, learn to play together. So I feel like whether it's a professional team, a youth team, uh, this can be really effective for, for all level players. Again, hitting the roller or throwing it back for a three-point shot, drilling it in three-on-three, three-on-zero, uh, and putting it into your offense, I think can be a great action for young young players as well as old. The short action, again, when you have two bigs in the post, a lot of teams will go to the short pick-and-roll action. So now, again, instead of spread floor spacing with four out, now you've got a four coming into a screen and going into a mid-roll. 
Again, guards, the ability to hit the, the roll man is important. And then the short action, big coming over. Again, we say with a post, passes out of the strike zone, present a target to your passer. And then in the third box, you see here, mid-roll playmaking, the ability to hit the roll man, and then for that roll man to be under control and pass it out. You know, I feel like with real young level players, this is not really a necessary like must do, but I think as kids get older, the more skilled you are at hitting the roller and making mid-roll plays, you know, the, the better you can be. Um, the next one will be, we call Boston dribble handoff fist. And like we said, you know, you have to think about your pick and rolls are all your pick and rolls with guards off the dribble are all your pick and rolls stationary. This is actually a pressure release for us where we call hand where our guard dribble hands off to a guard near him. And after the dribble handoff, we follow it with a pick and roll. Uh, so, you know, this is a situation you see here. We got a guard. It could be a coach handing off to the player in the corner and him just coming on the move off of a screen. Sometimes it's good to change up your pick and roll attack uh, at different levels. You know, instead of just staying a stagnant, oh, hey, we're playing pick and roll here. Now you've got a pick and roll on the move. You can create some separation with a defender, give your offensive team a chance. And then just like with the blast action, you can hit the diver, you can throw it back. So really similar in concept there. C action is, is Spain pick and roll action. We just call it C for a short. Uh, again, pick and roll with a back screen for the shooter. You know, this is difficult for a lot of teams to guard. When we would guard it, we would switch guard to guard with the big man having zero coverage. Or if teams try to play games with that shooter popping or slipping out early or doing something different, then we have base pick and roll coverage with the five and the one and our ultimate low man help on the backside. Uh, but this is something that a lot of teams will see. And I think it's just, you know, good to have that you know option in your offense. And then slot action. Again, a lot of teams are trying to shrink the floor and, and play, you know, elbows and boxes. Here you have a middle pick and roll or slot pick and roll. And the big point is to cut and slide on the backside. As the guard gets to the middle, the top help guy in the shrink is usually occupied. And, you know, you can get easy shots. And then they think about who are you putting in that spot that's fading? You know, you're putting your best shooting four man or you're putting a two. You got to think about those situations because a lot of times you can get some really easy looks for them in that cir circumstance right there. Uh, the flow, the second side action we talked about again, a lot of people in Canada will call it that umbrella on the second side with the four to two and the three 45 man cutting. And then, of course, you've got the swing pick and roll or swing dribble handoff. Uh, but again, you know, the other creative things that we try to work on helping high level players play together. Pin in, flare screen, basket cut to snap back post up, overcut or traffic where the guard is screening the big uh, on the backside. But again, I think all of these things help players of all ages play together. All right, Mike, thanks for uh, this so far. We've got uh, three right now. So coaches, if you've got some questions lined up, uh, please get them into the, uh, in the Q&A on your screen. And I'll start reading them off. I've got two of them myself that were sent to me directly. So I'll get to those ones as we go through these ones on the screen already. So I'll just read them off and coach uh, answer away. Um, yep. uh, you've seen them coach a lot of basketball. What are the biggest mistakes being made today in coaching youth basketball? Well, I, I feel like the emphasis on that I've seen, the emphasis on plays, the emphasis on trying to run a tactic or trying to sit in a two, three zone because the kids can't shoot from range. I think that the emphasis should be on, uh, you know, skill work should be on fundamental development on learning to read the game. Um, you know, you've, you've all seen that, that team at youth levels that sits in a zone because they can just sit in a zone defense, you know, just cause they want to win or the team that just pressures full court and just locks teams up and just overmatches an opponent. You know, I think that, for me, it's about teaching players how to play, having skills, and how to play together, reading the game rather than teaching them all kinds of different set plays and things like that. There, there's a need for spacing. There's a need for structure. But, I, again, this is why I was so good or so focused on the advantage-disadvantage situation. Okay, great. Uh, next question is, uh, what situations call for a high outlet? versus banana cut outlet as seen in your warm-up drill video clips. Yeah. So the, the basic that we have is, is a basic banana cut, but there's times where there can be like a, a, a law, like a rebound or the point guard feels like he's, he's not being pressured full court. 
if you want to try to trigger that fast break early, you know, get to that sideline. So basically, you know, after a make, basically you're looking at the banana cut most of the time, uh, unless you're cutting to get open in floor space against full court pressure. Uh, and on misses and defensive rebounds, live ball situations, that's where you can try to sneak out and get to that sideline for the high outlet. Okay, great. How, uh, next question is how long, how long would you recommend running the conditioning or pace drills that you showed at the early part? Uh, like yeah. So I put five minutes on the clock for the whole group and basically just try to see how many races they can win. Right. So not long. Uh, again, we do it in the preseason um, and we did it, you know, you would, you would basically have the whole team do it and try to rotate lines uh, but it's not something you're going to do mid-season because it, it is a pretty, you know, exhausting drill. All right, next question. We've got a few more here. Um, how do you deal with or address a player that puts a lot of weight on themselves after a tough loss? Teddy comes to mind, specifically late in the season. This is something I see even at the young club level. Well, you know, we have all got to be able to handle success and, and struggles. Um Teddy was super emotional. Uh, you know, he loved the, the sea bears. He loved us, you know, and, and again, you know, he was a huge part of our success. He had high expectations for himself, the team, everyone, um, you know, and we all did, you know, but to me it was about, you know, Hey, we're, we're brand new. We're, we're trying to, you know, establish the sea bears. We, we established the sea bears in a great way. And again, you try to maximize your team. And I feel like we maximize our team as much as we could. Um, you know, there's some things that, that we needed to be better at to really be a championship level team. Uh, but for an expansion team, I think we did many, many things well. Uh, but we're always trying to improve and trying to get better. You want to help players manage the results uh, and stay focused on the process. You know, some people are harder on themselves. Um, but th the good thing about that is that there's they intrinsically care. Uh, so what I like to say to people that may be going through a tough situation or putting a lot of pressure on them, so, hey, be friends with yourself. You know, you, you, you have to look at the positives and look at all the good things you're doing. Uh, we all have to live with results. We have to live with the success. We have to live with the failure. Uh, but again, it's all part of the process. And I think you try to help young players, boys, girls, pros, amateurs, you try to help them understand that, that losing is part of what helps you win. Okay, hey, I've got a few more on my uh, side here, but I got one more on the screen here. Uh, for a team that's not the most experienced, how difficult of drills and plays would you suggest? I guess level of difficulty in some of these. I would not look at difficulty. I would just, you know, try to be as clear and as focused as possible. Maybe you go slower, you slow the pace down, and meaning you focus on one drill and you focus on the coaching points in that drill. And you make sure the team gets it and they feel good about it. And that's why I put earlier in the, in the presentation, you focus on repeating drills. So the players are comfortable, the players, you know, feel good about uh, them being able to master it. Okay. This is the last call for other questions that may come up on the screen. Uh, coaches, uh, I've got two here that uh, I'll throw to coach Mike right now and we'll wrap things up. Um what initially drew you into coaching basketball? My dad was a coach. Um, he coached under Bob Knight at West Point at Army. Um, he was a head division two coach and coach. He was an assistant with the Knicks. He was assistant at Creighton. I just grew up around the game, grew up, you know, have, being coached by him and having all these discussions about basketball. So I think growing up with it, seeing my dad as an example and role model uh, and loving it, you know, so um it's definitely a passion. It's something I, I love, and I'm so thankful for all the experiences, you know, in different countries around the world through the game. Great. Uh, another one up on the screen here. What is the working time that Bud has had to be able to have a very compact team according to your experience? Uh, I don't know who Bud is. Maybe you do. <laughs> it's a great question. Um, so... You know, again, every team is a, is a process to try to come together and grow together, and you're working on different personalities, so that's kind of a hard question to answer. Uh, but you can structure your team with roles. You can structure your team with with a good system, and I think that helps. Um, but, again, yeah, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. It takes hard work. 
Okay, next one up on the screen here. Uh, how do you find a balance between setting realistic expectations for a season versus championship aspirations? And how do you translate that to your players? Well, I think the first thing is, you know, everyone wants to be a part of a championship team, but, you know, championship teams, not every team is a championship caliber team. Uh, the focus should be on maximizing potential and earning the right to be a competitor, a contender. And if you can maximize your potential and grow together as a team and, and go through the adversity that you need to, to, you know, toughen you up, then great, great things can happen. But you have to earn the right to be a championship contender. Uh, and that's every team starts from the beginning. And you got to try to, you know, help people understand that it's hard work. It's teamwork and it, it's a process. It, it happens week for week, game to game. Uh, and every single day, you got to try to get better. You got to handle the success. You got to handle the setbacks. Uh, and then hopefully you give yourself a chance in the playoffs. And and I think, you know, all of the pre, all of the preseason, the season is preparation. And then hopefully you have that opportunity in playoffs to to be that championship level team and make that dream come true. Uh, last one on the screen here, and I got one more uh, that came to me directly. Uh, compare European development philosophies to American or North American. Yeah, I think it's interesting. You know, uh, to me, the the American mindset is so much on games and AAU and play, 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 play. And it's great. Play games, play competition. The, the competition in the United States is fantastic. It's unbelievable. Um, but again, I think the skill focus is is clearly uh, the, the primary thing overseas. Um you know, kids go in the gym and they're really working on their game, their skills, they're focusing on their drills. And, and I think you can see the, the shooting passing. And the, the other point is the team play, the, the two on two pick and roll in the USA is two on two to score one on one on two to score, you know, and overseas you're, you're relying on your teammates, you're using your teammates. And I think that's, uh, that's at the press, that's at the, the forefront of it all. Okay, great. Last one I've got here, and I think this will probably finish us for the afternoon with uh, Coach Taylor here, is uh, what do you know about coaching basketball today that you wish you knew when you first started? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, that's uh, – I just think that basketball has changed in terms of the, the coaching styles. You know, again, my dad was a big Bob Knight guy, and I think you had that – you know, style and, and that's changed to, to where it is now. Uh, players have changed. People have changed. I just think it, something I don't, that I know now that I didn't know then it's just more about adjusting and being able to adapt and adjust to the different people that you're working with different ages, different backgrounds, uh, different experience levels, different situations, different countries. I think that is, is kind of the, the biggest thing. I wouldn't say it's something I know now that I didn't know then. I just think it's, uh, accumulation of experience from all of those different situations. Well, we got one more snuck in. This will be our last one. We have here. One That's more right. question. Uh, high school teams see a lot of zone defenses. What is your philosophy strategy against zone defenses? Um, suggestions for practices. So what, what I've seen with practices a lot. So I, for me, zone defense is a secondary. It's a change up. It's a it's a change of tempo. It's hey, they call the timeout and they're drawing up a man play. Let's switch the zone. Let's put a zone press on and, and fall back into a zone to change the, the rhythm of the game. I'm a I'm a zone is secondary defense for me. However, uh, you have to be able to attack zones efficiently. And and again, you know, teams that have experience, players that have experience and really understand it, you know have a clear philosophy of what you're doing, have a handful of actions. I like to have five or six different actions that you can go to, to create a good shot for your team. Um, but in terms of, you know, any suggestions for practice, the one thing that always seems to happen whenever you switch from man practice, getting up and down, then you go, okay, we're going to play zone. There's usually a naturally tendency to let down and, and, and guys relax a little bit because they're playing zone defense. Um, whether you play zone or don't play zone, you need to try to find a way to keep that intensity at, at, you know, in practice. And I've always tried to have the zone be at the end of practice because I'm, I'm expecting a little drop off in intensity and focus. So at least it's towards the end. Uh, and we've got a lot accomplished before that. Um, but to me, you know, it's just about anything else being prepared and, and having your guys, all five, be able to read the game with a clear picture on the floor together, um, and really just execute. So, um, you know, 
the, the, part of the effectiveness of zone defense sometimes is not necessarily the zone, but the offense's inability to attack it. So you want to find ways to generate great shots. And a lot of times I think that's guards using their dribble, getting into gaps, getting a paint touch, drawing two players, uh, and, you know, creating shots for their teammates. Super. Well, this will uh, put a pin in it there, Coach. We really appreciate your time and insight on the game and your passion, obviously, uh, uh, spills over big time for the game. And we're lucky to have you here in Winnipeg uh, this last summer. And um, uh, we, of course, want to see the Sea Bears grow and grow. And uh, you're a huge part of that. So we're very excited to see, see the game and the team uh, have a presence here. Like I mentioned those stats earlier on at the start uh, of the, or, or the impact we're already seeing. So uh, we appreciate your time with us this afternoon. And, Thank you, uh, Adam. I appreciate it. Please you. say hello to all basketball fans in Winnipeg. And uh, really, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. It was a lot of fun. Super. Okay. Thanks again, Coach. Yep. We'll keep in touch.